thank you so much everybody for being on the call this morning we trust the holy spirit to lead us and guide us all right so um today we're going to look at jesus again still on the tangents of discovering the different expressions of jesus or the different um, 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 um personalities of jesus or the different with the different types of work that jesus does in our lives today we're going to look at jesus as the bread of life Jesus at the bread of life. And this is something that we've heard all the time or we hear all the time. And, you know, even in the Lord's prayer, we hear it, give us this day our daily bread. And we hear Jesus, Jesus says in his word, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, what does this mean? That's what we're going to find out today. How is it relevant in our lives? That's what we're also going to find out today. So we're going to be in um, John chapter 6. So if we can just turn our Bibles to John chapter 6. Um, I'm going to be reading from 25 to 33 to begin with. But then um, afterwards, we'll go into the 40s region towards 60. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. So I'm reading from 25. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. Hallelujah. Amen. So what is, what is happening over here? So, okay, so these people, so basically these are people that had been um, present the day before. So the day before was when Jesus performed that, you know, that, that, that famous miracle that one of the, probably the first miracles that we learn as children, you know, the, 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 the loaves of fishes, and the, the two, two fishes and the five loaves of bread miracle where he multiplies it and he's able to feed 5,000 people. Now, of course, this is a massive miracle. So the town is probably like buzzing with excitement. So the next day, people have come, you know, probably people who were there who actually, you know, partook of the miracle and probably people who had heard about it. They were coming. They're like, yo, I'm all for free food, man. These are people who are freeloaders. They were ready for free food, you know, and Jesus calls them out. Jesus called them, I was like, listen, 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 let's, let's be real over here, okay? You guys shouldn't come and try and like, listen, I have this all figured out. You're not really here because, you know, you actually understood the significance of the miracle signs that I did. But you're here because, you know, you want your tummy to be filled again. That's what it is. And he's like, guys, you have it wrong. He said, spend your energy. He said, he said um, don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. Okay, so now I really want us to look first of all, even as him talking about the bread of life, why, why would Jesus use um, the imagery or the analogy of, or the metaphor really of, 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 being, of being bread, okay? So when we look at bread, we know that bread is a staple food, okay? When we talk about staple, staple food, we're basically talking about food that you pretty much cannot do without in any given place. So that is constantly being eaten in a given place, okay? So we know that even, even, even in our region, which is not as popular, bread is still pretty much a staple for a lot of people, but especially so in the Middle Eastern areas, you know? And it, it, it's that which, when we're talking still on staple food, is that which constitutes the majority of a diet and allows for sustenance, for growth, okay? 
So when Jesus was saying that, he was using the analogy of the bread of life. What he was saying that, what he was saying in effect was that he is the staple of life. He is the very staple of life, the life that gives life to life. He is that which births life. He is that which grows life. He is that which sustains and preserves life. Okay, so here I want us to I want us to understand. Jesus says something where he's telling them that listen, don't spend your energy on things that are perishable. He said, spend your energy seeking eternal life. Because you see, when we say eternal life as Christians, one of the things that I've realized is that for a long time, even that was how my understanding of eternal life was. It says, spend, I'm, I'm talking about the point that says, spend your energy seeking eternal life, okay? And I was saying, I'm talking about eternal life. Now, Jesus is talking about eternal life. So what is this eternal life? He's telling them that, listen, guys, you are getting a twisted focusing on perishable food, on things that you have been eating for sustenance, but things that are here today, gone tomorrow, things that don't truly give real life. And he's saying that I want you to spend your energy thinking about um, eternal life. You are investing your energy into eternal life. So what is this eternal life that Jesus is talking about? You see, and I'm here defining eternal life because for a long time, I thought this is what I thought eternal life was. I thought eternal life was basically life forever, life forever with Jesus. Okay. But the truth of the matter is that eternal life is not only measured in duration. It's also measured in donation. Eternal life is not only measured in quantity, but it's also measured in quality. Now, the truth about eternal life is that it's so much more than living forever. Because when we get to the crux of the matter, the truth is everyone will live forever. It is a matter of your location. You will either be in hell or you will be in heaven. But as for living forever, you will be alive. As a, 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 a living as we understand living to, to be. But when Jesus was talking about eternal life, Jesus was not only talking about it in terms of living forever with me. No, he wasn't only talking about it. He was talking about the quality of life. He was talking about the quality of life. So eternal life does not start when you die. Eternal life starts when you accept Jesus Christ. So let's understand what is eternal life. John chapter 17 verse 3. Please send your Bibles with me to John 17, verse 3. Jesus gives the answer there. Very, very, very straightforward answer. Okay? So John chapter 17, verse 3. This is what he says. And this is life eternal, that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Bam. He didn't say eternal life is not dying and living forever. No. That's a part of it, but that's not all of it. Eternal life is that you will know the only one true God, Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. You see, a lot of times when we hear the, the scripture, John 3, 16, what does it say? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life or have life everlasting. The trouble is that we end up ending at perish, period. That for God so loved the world that he gave his, only, um, his, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish. That's all we think about. It's not just about get out of hell free. Uh -uh. That's not eternal life. Eternal life is to know. Like Jesus said in John 17 verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So he's saying that spend your energy seeking eternal life. In other words, spend your energy seeking to know me. And I'm not talking about knowing on a surface level, no. We're not talking about knowing in terms of um, 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 knowing somebody intellectually or knowing somebody based on an introductory basis, no. We are talking about knowing. Whenever the Bible talks about knowing, it talks about knowing in the context of a man and a woman knowing each other, a man and a woman coming together. We're talking about the knowing that Adam had of Eve, his wife. It was not an intellectual knowing, like I'm saying. It was a deep knowing. And knowing, this knowing will entail total transparency. It will entail vulnerability. It will ent entail intense intentionality. When you look at a couple, for instance, a couple cannot know each other while they are apart. No, it's impossible. 
They cannot. As much as technology has done so many things, it has not solved this problem yet. It took a couple that's found in America and one that's found in Ghana. They cannot know each other if they are, you know, if they are apart. And uh, knowing requires proximity, close proximity. This is the kind of the know, um, knowing that the Lord is talking about. To, to, that is the real eternal life that Jesus is saying that. Seek eternal life. In other words, seek to know me. A couple will be so close together. It is I in you, you in me. It's an intertwining, a joining, a union. The two literally becoming as one. That is what Jesus meant when Jesus was talking in John, um, John 14, John 15, thereabouts, where he was talking about abiding in me and he, and, and, and he abiding in us. That is what he was talking about. That is the intertwining. That is the death of the knowing. Okay? So Jesus is saying that stop wasting precious energy on perishable things, temporary things, things that are inconsequential in the final analysis. You do those things at the expense of real life. Everything that does not have me literally will suck life from you. It will drain life from you. I am the one who will add life to you. So if you are, if you are going to really truly live, then you cannot do it apart from me, apart from knowing me. You see, he's, he's saying that, you know, basically every day your heart is beating. Every day that you wake up to a new day, the, 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 the most of your energy must be spent towards knowing him. That is eternal life. That is what he died for you to have. So we are not just here saved to be stuck. Saved just trying to get by here on earth and, you know, we'll be singing where we all get to heaven, you know. Just trying to manage and cope here on earth while we are waiting for, you know, eternal life to start. Uh -uh, eternal life started the day you accepted Jesus. The point is that are you spending your energy investing in, 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 in seeking eternal life into, into, into growing in, even in this life that has been given to you? He's saying that he is the real life. He is eternal life. He is that which causes a person to, you know, that which causes a person to come alive is found in him. That which causes a person to stay alive is found in him. So there, there are false illusions that we have clung to, mistaking them for life. These people were getting the wrong idea. They thought there was the manna, the manna in heaven, um, um, what do you call it, um, the, the manna that they experienced in the wilderness. Because it's like, come on, guys, you're missing this whole thing. You're missing it. You guys are spending your energy on the wrong things. And there are, there are things as well that give us the false illusion of, of, of being able to give life. But nothing can give life outside of Jesus. Nothing can sustain life out of Jesus. He's inviting us this morning not to just exist, but to live. He's inviting us to truly live. For this is the reason why he came. He said, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He's not just talking about it. Just when we, when we talk about abundance, normally we are looking in terms of quantity. But then again, no. Again, it is the quality. Have real life. Know what it means to be really alive. Know what it means to really do life. You cannot do it independent of me. So he's saying that, guys, you've been, we, we, have been, we, have been, we have been spending energy, you know, seeking the wrong things. And you see, this process of knowing, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process. So some, some people will say, oh, well, I think, you know, I think I'm good. Like, listen, okay, Jesus and I, we've been at this thing for a while. And, you know, I, at least I know him. I know him. Maybe this word doesn't really apply to me because I know him. Uh-uh. Not in his economy. You can never know him well enough. Because what did the Bible say? The Bible said that he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will even be more fruitful. He always calls us to more. There is more in him. Like even, just look at, just look at it even in terms, of, in terms of trying to know a human being. Spouses will, will attest to this. You know, you would, I remember, I remember my, my dad used to say this a lot. Like it was, it was like a standing joke. Like you know, he and my mom had been married for a good, what, you know, 33 or 34 years before she passed. And basically, you know, every time he would say, he would say, no, I'm going to the school of your mommy. I'm studying your mommy. Like, you know, I'm studying this woman. And I'm like, ah, but daddy, what level are you in? The last, the last time I checked, the most recent, about four years ago, you know, he said, oh, I'm, I'm now in secondary school. I haven't even gotten to university. 
I haven't even begin, begun to really know this woman. Can you imagine? This is even in, in terms of, um, 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 in a human context. How much more God? How much more God? So there's never a time where we should, you know, get to a place where we are content and comfortable and we're like, oh, you know, you know I've, I've eaten. I've eaten this bread. I think, I, uh-uh. No, that's not what he's calling us to. He's not calling us to that. He never told us to stop eating. I'll actually get to that point and break that down better. But the bottom line is that there is so much more to know. There is so much more to discover, even in God. There is so much more to discover in God. And that is why, why do you think um, Paul will say, you know, in fact, let's go, let's go there. Let's go to Philippians 3 verse 10. Philippians 3 verse 10. Can someone please read it for me? Stephanie, can you help me? Sure. Okay. Philippians 3 verse 10. Um, mm-hmm. I want to know Christ. Yes, mm. to know the power of his resurrection and participation mm-hmm. in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Mm. Mm-hmm. Can you actually start from eight? Um, mm-hmm. Seven, please. Seven to ten. Yes, seven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Thank you. One second. But whatever were gains to me, I mm. now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Mm-hmm. What is more, I consider mm. everything a loss. Mm. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, Mm. I consider them garbage, that I may (laughs) gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness Mm -hmm. of my own that comes from Mm -hmm. the law, but Mm. that which which is through faith in Christ, the Mm. righteousness that comes from God on the basis of Mm. faith. I want to Hallelujah. Yes, Amen. to know the power of his resurrection and participation mm. in his sufferings, becoming like mm-hmm. him in his death, and so Hallelujah. somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Amen. That's, that's fine. Amen. Thank you so much. Guys, can you imagine? Look, look at this. Though. This is Uncle Paul talking. Mm-hmm. This is Uncle Paul. This is him after he has become a Christian. Let's understand. This was not um, Saul. This is Paul. This is Paul talking. And yet, what is Paul saying? What, Paul, what are you talking about? What are you saying that I may gain Christ again after you have been established as a Christian and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Paul took a stock of his life. This guy had an impressive resume, impressive pedigree, everything. All the things that he had previously considered as valuable, Paul now carefully placed them side by side with the value of knowing Christ. And guess what? He called them rubbish. Another version said he called it dung, meaning dung, fit for nothing, useless. It cannot be used for anything. This is what Paul called all those things that were, things that he had previously prided himself in, you know, he was pumped up and puffed up about, he now considered as dung and as rubbish. Imagine. That is the value of knowing Jesus. And Paul never got to the place where, in spite of all his revelations, the person who wrote three quarters of the, of the New Testament, the person who, um, had to, who was privy to all these incredible divine encounters, this is the person talking that I may gain Christ. So all this, what do you have? Because he realized that this is a never-ending thing. It is bottomless. It is bottomless. And he realized the value of it, the surpassing worth. Nothing else could possibly, nothing else could possibly compare to it. So my question today is that, you know, there, there are things that we've come, we've come into Christ first, or, um, you know, fair enough, we've come into Christ. But the thing is that, is he the daily bread that we are truly eating? Is he the staple? Or he is, he is we have put him in something else where it is like, you know, okay, let me use you as some spice to sprinkle here and there. Let me use you as garnishing to just arrange this and this. But is he the main dish? Is he the main dish? Is everything else uh, and, and build it around him? Or he's rather, after everything has been done, that you try and, oh, let me, let me put a bit of Jesus here. Let's sprinkle some Jesus here. Let's sprinkle some Holy Spirit here. What, what is your approach with God? And what, what, what position does he hold in your life? 
What position does he hold in your life? Paul relegated everything. Paul had to consciously begin to demote things in his life. Things that he had previously put beyond everything. His accomplishments, his, you know, his, his status, his so many other things. He put all of those behind. He said, no, 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 no. This, everything is done. Everything is useless. Everything is... And now, my life, my energy, my, the best of me is going to go into seeking eternal life. The best of me is going to make sure that I gain Christ. The best of me is going to make sure that at the end of the day, I lay hold of, of the things that he died so that I will lay hold of. Can we say the same thing? God is charging us this morning to take a conscious and an honest look at our lives to do a real evaluation most of the time when as christians we know the right answers so we'll give it oh yeah jesus you know you think jesus be the center of my life jesus be, we can say all the right things but there is no need pretending because god sees all and god knows all truly 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 what position does god hold in your life no wonder sometimes we come apart so much when either set, we lose certain things or, you know, certain people exit our lives because we have placed them where they did not belong in the first place. Because we have made them the center and the staple of our lives. When those things are now absent, we feel like our lives are over. Because now we built our lives around those things. That was where we were taking our bearings from. That was what gave us comfort. That was our sense of stability. Those were the pillars, the pillars or the cornerstones we had used in building our homes, building our lives. And so now when those things suddenly exit, it can be a person, it can be a thing, it can be material, it can be immaterial. But when those things exit, then now we find ourselves, my God, my life is over. Uh-uh, your life is not no, over because your life was never them in the first place. Your life has always been to know God. That is true life. That is eternal life. That is what he died for you to have. That is what he died for you to have. So this morning he's charging us, people of God, He's telling us to stop expending energy on things that, that, that are useless, are worthless, that have expiry dates and start to, start to labor for the things that will not perish. Start to put your time and your resources into the things that are of eternal value. Because everything else would, you only need to go to your garage to see how temporary things are. Things that previously you had spent so much money on buying this phone or buying this gadget or whatnot, two, three years, pop. The value, that, that should just show you that, that that is the same as every other thing in life. When my mom passed and recently we had to go and do, um, you know, go and do the, the very difficult thing of going through her clothes and all of these things and stuff like that. I, I was just like, I was like, wow, how, yes. how pointless, how futile. Because, because this was someone who, before she had died, had just gone on a major shopping spree in the U.S., had so many things. She, had not, she did not even get the chance to wear. Because at the end of the day, where she was going, she could not take it. It was eternally useless. So why do we spend so much energy and time on things that will just perish? Why don't we spend energy and time on building the things that at the end of the, of the day will have eternal value? To know him is to have eternal life. That is what he's telling us to do today. Another thing I want us, before we go into prayer, another thing that I want us to look at is that, um, let's look at John chapter 6, 57 to 58. Still on John chapter 6. Let me read that quickly. John chapter 6, 57 to 58. He says, I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. Again, I'm telling you, dying is not as dying as we know dying. That's not what he means. If that was the case, Adam and Eve's story should have literally ended in the Garden of Eden. But it wasn't physical death we were talking about. If you eat of this, you will die. He was saying that you were going to lose. You were going to lose that privilege of knowing me the way you, you, you knew me. That was eternal life. So that was what he made that if you eat of it, you will die. And Satan deceived them and said, you will not die. So, so, so the fact that your heart is beating does not mean you are alive. It is knowing God. The day, look, the, 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 what would be recorded in heaven in terms of when we actually started to live was when, it, 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 it's going to start from when, 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 when we actually knew God. That is eternal life. So wh- why am I reading this? 
What, what did Jesus do while he was on earth? I live, because, I live because of the living father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. You know, one thing I love about Jesus, and I feel like it's even exemplary in leadership, the, 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 the leadership style of Jesus, is that he never asked us to do anything that he never first did. And he's saying that while I, me, Jesus, me, Jesus, the son of God, while I, I was here on earth, I lived because I was feeding on my father. In the same way, you will also live if you, if you feed on me. So he said, excuse me. <clears throat> so he said, so also the one who feeds on me will live because, not the one who fed on me. Not the one who was feeding on me. The one who feeds, it's present, it's continuous, it doesn't stop. While you are here on earth, the entire time he was on earth, that was what he was doing. And that is, he sets the precedence for us. That is the same thing we are required to be doing. Who told you to stop eating? Who told you? Who told you? You think that food is not enough? No. <laughs> it's inexhaustible. He's saying that continue to feed on me. So Jesus is saying that, listen, you, you, you know, I fed on my father. I fed on my father. And that's what caused me to live. And that is the same way that I'm asking of you to feed on me. We look at the, the example of Elijah. Elijah had a mental breakdown, okay? Elijah was suicidal. And, you know, he went to, he went to this juniper tree. That was where he was telling God, you know, I'm done. Peace out, eight town. Take my life. What is it? I'm not even better than my ancestors. This guy was broken. He was suicidal, all of that. And what happened? The angel of the Lord brought him food and water and asked him to eat. So Elijah ate some of it. Then he, he lies down again because he was sleeping when the, when the angel woke him up. So he lies down again. I guess he goes, he, goes, he goes back to snooze or whatever he was doing. But what happened? The angel woke him up and said, hey, 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 hey. You have to keep eating. He said, eat some more. Eat some more or else you will not have, you will not have strength for the journey that is ahead. The principle applies to us. God never told us to stop eating. He has not uh, asked us to stop eating. He said, even, even, even with what he asked us to do with the communion and the fact that he said, do this as often as you can, it shows that it was symbolic of what he expects to be our reality. Eat every day. Give me, oh Lord, my daily bread. Eat of him daily. He's available. Eat of him daily. Even when he was given the communion, what did he say? He said, take. He said, eat. He said, drink. He didn't say, he, he, he said, take, because what? He has already given. So it's yours now for the taking. He said, take. Nobody can take for you. Nobody is going to eat for you. Nobody is going to do. You will have to make that conscious effort to eat and drink of yourself. And don't stop eating and drinking. Don't stop eating and drinking. You know, God never designed us to do life independently of him. While Adam and Eve, again, when they are in the Garden of Eden, their ability to have dominion and steward the things God had entrusted them was hinged to their feeding on God. When they switched feeding systems and ate the forbidden fruits as opposed to the living bread, now they found themselves bringing ramifications that were going to outlive them. And here we are today because of Adam and Eve. Intermittent feeding will bring intermittent revelation, intermittent strength, intermittent power. But constant feeding will bring constant strength constant revelation and constant power. Guys, I want us to begin to pray, even, 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 even based on this. I want us to pray and I want us to pray and cry out to God that Father Lord Jesus, where I have been feeding from the wrong system, so God, but I begin to expose them, oh God, and begin yes. to give me now the grace to feed on Let's you and feed of you in the mighty name of Jesus, because you have the words of life in the name of Jesus. People of God, can we begin to lift up our voices even and pray on this point in the mighty name of Jesus? So, um, John 6 from 62. Um, in fact, let me read from 16 to give it to give it more context. Many of his disciples said, So this and this were these were difficult truths. Okay. These were things that people could not easily stomach. They could not easily digest these things. So verse 16 says, Many of his disciples said, This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. I'm coming. I think someone needs to please mute for me. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. 61 was saying, Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? 62, then what will you think if you see the son of man ascend to heaven again? 
63, the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and our life. It says what? The spirit alone gives eternal life. So this business of knowing him, this business of having eternal life and embracing him as the bread of heaven, it cannot be done without engaging the spirit. Who can know the mind of God if it were not the spirit of God? It's the spirit of God that will lead us into all truth. It's the spirit alone, as Jesus is saying, that gives eternal life because human effort accomplishes nothing. No wonder Jesus was so adamant that we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In John 37, he cries out on the last day and the greatest day of this festival, the Bible says Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, another verse says Jesus stood and shouted, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirits whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirits had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. And I want us to quickly go to Ezekiel 47 so that I can illustrate this better. Ezekiel 47. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me quickly read. Then he brought me back. I'm reading from one. He brought me back to the door of the temple. And behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hands, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water. It was ankle deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water. It was knee deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water. It was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass through for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in a river that could not be passed through. Another version talks about the fact that not only it could not be passed through, but he was completely submerged in it. Okay. And we know that when, when we, you know, we know that the water, water in the, in the Bible often symbolizes the spirit of God. Okay. And Jesus is saying here about knowing him, this business of knowing him, it cannot be done without the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit alone who is able to give eternal life, who is able to give you the capacity and the ability to know Jesus, okay? So what, 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 what does this whole scenario present to us, okay? For me, this river, it illustrates the potential of a truly spirit-filled believer who makes room for the Holy Spirit. So it's showing you the depth and the possibilities that are in God. Why didn't the, the man who was showing Ezekiel the vision just um, basically like, you know, Ezekiel could have been standing and could have said, hey, behold, you know, behold the water. Behold this water that is available, this river that is available. No. But he actually asked him to come inside. He, he actually asked him to enter so that he would know the size and the depth of the river. That he would, he would, be, he would know that, that the possibilities were, were endless. Basically, when it came to the spirit of God, you know, and it also shows you that you will go as far as you allow the Holy Spirit. When, when your, 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 your Christian experience starts or when you give your life to Christ, you know, you, 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 you start, you are saved, or everything is nice and dandy, you know, you know, but you are at ankle level. The water is only at your ankle. The water is only at your ankle. And the water here, it feels nice and comfortable because it's at ankle level. But the rest of your body is still, is still, is, there's still too much body exposed. There's still too much flesh exposed. The, 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 the spirit has not taken complete, has not completely taken over yet, you know? So you, you, you can move and you can, you feel like, oh, I can get away with things and, oh, okay, so this accepting Jesus, this is where it ends, you know? For some people, this is where it ends for them. They remain at ankle level. There are some people who will now go to knee level, you know? So they, they, they're a bit wet, but they're not quite there yet. Then there are those who will now go to waist level. 
And you see, a lot of times, it's the waste level that we get stuck because we feel like, oh, at least uh, half of me, 50-50. I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. Half of me, you know, half of me is wet. But that's not what he's asking for. The waste is impressive because at least, yes, half of your, your body is covered. But that is not the ideal. That is not the, the reach that God is looking for. You are not all the way there yet. He's calling us to get to the point where we are fully drenched. We've plunged ourselves into him. We are submerged in the spirit and there is none of us left. You have gone completely deep and there is none of you left. That is what he's asking us to do. And so Ezekiel was, was taken through this to see the possibilities and that, 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 that are in the rivers of life. Jesus was saying that out of his belly, the, the person, listen, the person who was previously thirsty, he said out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Imagine. So if you come to him and you drink of him and you keep drinking of him, not only will your thirst be quenched, but every area of your life that was parched will now be saturated. And not only that, you will now become, you know, you will now become a source for other people. That is what he's calling us to, guys. That is what he's calling us to. He's calling us to engage the Holy Spirit on a whole new level. That this thing, you know, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. You go deeper and you go deeper and you're like, oh my God. What, 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 what do I think I have known all this while? Recently, I, 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 I've, just been, I've just been so bowled over by a story that I read. You know, it's the, 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 name of the, book is, um, the name of the book is We Died Before We Came Here. And I was like, I was so bowled over when I read that book because I was like, Jesus, I don't know which version of Christianity I've been subscribing to. But there is more. There is more. I read a, I read a story about, about this couple of missionary and them going to a hostile Muslim country and the things they did and literally how they, 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 they died before they got there. So for them, nobody could take their life because everybody kept on warning them. And really, at the end of the day, the man, the, the husband lost his life. But for him, the issue wasn't about somebody taking my life. We have already died before we came here. There's none of me left. I, am, I have emerged myself, submerged myself completely in this water of life. I have decided to lay my life down. I have decided, so before I've even come here, I'm dead. So whatever you do is just a formality. I don't exist anymore. I don't exist anymore. It is Christ now that lives within me. Isn't that what it is about Christ in us, the hope of glory? It's not about us having our way anymore. It is now, it is now Christ that is, he remains central. He remains core. He remains the essence of everything that we do. So this morning, guys, I want, us to, I want us to use the last few minutes to pray. And I want us to pray based on the things that we have heard. And say, Father, Lord, if there is more, I want all of it. If Paul, if Paul, a whole Paul, where we, 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 to, today we are privy to the things we know about God because, because of, of Paul willing to lay aside his life and literally just live for the agenda of God and the agenda of the kingdom, you know, who are we? Who are we? There is so much more, guys. There is so much more of God. There are all the heights, all the depth. If only we would allow ourselves. He said, don't stop eating. Don't stop. He said, take, eat, drink. Do this as often as you can. Eat of me. And we cannot do it out. We cannot do it independently of the spirit. So will you join, will you join me? Even as we pray and we, and we engage God for the next seven minutes or so. We engage God and we say, Father, Father, help us to keep feeding. Father, show us how to plunge deep. Show us how to go in all the way with you, O oh God. Because to know you is to know real life. To know you is to really come alive. What we have been doing has not been the ideal, has not been what, what you died for us to have, has not been your premium. We have, we have been satisfied with ankle level and we have been satisfied with knee level. But it's about time to plunge. It's about time to be fully submerged. That they come and they are looking for Stephanie. They can't find Stephanie anymore. Why? Stephanie has gone under. She has gone under. They look for, they look for Adiola. They can't find Adiola. Adiola has gone under. Okay, she has yeah. gone under in the name of Jesus. Shall we just, shall we just lift up our voices and shall, we just, shall we just pray in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Yasmin. God bless you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Just before we go, just very, very, very briefly before we go, um, Yasmin, with regards to everything that you have said, uh, mm. I believe it's very spot on and um, mm. even the sequence of us, you mm. know, uh, studying about the cornerstone mm. yesterday and then today mm. on the bread of life. Mm. You see what mm. you said about eating mm. while you were speaking, mm -hmm. the Lord started mm. to, you know, I just like to receive in my heart mm. that this mm. matter of eating, it is not mm. something that we do here alone because yes. when we 
here, mm. when we get to mm. heaven, there is the mm. marriage supper of the Lamb that is waiting for mm. us. We are going mm. to eat mm. there. And then mm. the Bible even tells us mm. in Revelations yeah. chapter 2, in verse what? 7 and in verse 17, those two mm. different verses, it talks mm. about mm. to the one that is victorious, I would, I, would, I would give him from the hidden manner. Then in verse 17, mm. it talks about the one that is victorious, I, I shall mm. give him um, access to it from the tree of life. You see, so mm. we're going to... And I believe that one of the things that God is doing for us in this season is that he's giving us perspective as we eat his word. He's showing us that everything that we are doing here is not just for here alone. And that is why related to what we learned in today, when Pastor Linda was bringing the word yesterday, one of the things she had said about the cornerstone is that everything that we do or do not do, you know, um, brings judgment. Everything that we do brings judgment. And it now depends on what exactly we are doing. So as children of God, we have to be very, very careful and be very, very discerning in the things that we engage and entangle ourselves in. Because whether or not we are aware or not, you know, ignorance is not an excuse at this point anymore. Um, whatever we do or do not do will bring some kind of judgment or condemnation, either upon us or upon the kingdom of darkness. So we have to be, you know, we have to be very careful whose side we are on. And a typical example we see of this is the story of Noah when he was building the act that mm. act of obedience building mm. according to the lord's standards it brought condemnation upon the world you see, mm. it brought condemnation upon the generation that was on the earth at the time so we have to be very careful how we are feasting what we are eating mm. what we are setting mm. our hearts on and we see mm. that even in um the book of um just very quickly i know we have to go um but i just really wanted to share this we see this in the book of um i believe it is first corinthians chapter 11 it talks about whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the lord a man ought to mm. examine himself mm. before he eats mm. of the bread and drinks of the cup for anyone mm. who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself so we see that mm -hmm. it is even you know there there are so many implications of the acts that we engage ourselves in we have mm -hmm. to eat because it is our responsibility not eating mm. will bring judgment upon us so we cannot mm. be lukewarm it is either we are on the lord's side or we are on the other side and I, I just pray mm. that the lord will give us understanding you know as he has Amen. set eternity Amen. in our hearts it is for Amen. us to understand you know the the, 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 the the his will for our lives it is for us to Amen. understand why he's asking us to do these things i pray that we receive perspective i pray that we walk in discernment and that Amen. none of the things that we do or get ourselves entangled with shall bring any form of judgment upon us Amen. in the mighty name of jesus mm -hmm. i pray that each and every one of us will walk in the fullness of the knowledge of god today and our mm -hmm. eyes will continue to stay in open jesus in the mighty name, name of jesus amen. amen god bless you all thank you so much yes. thank you everyone